This webinar is brought to you by CHRMP, Certified Human Resource Management Professional. CHRMP is a global certification in human resource management. Uh, and this certification can be taken in 190 countries, 5,600 test centers. Our certification partner is PearsonView. For more details, you can visit www.chrmp.com. Uh, my name is Animesh. I head the uh, certification division at Ripples Learning and I'm responsible for uh, the uh, new course design and delivery at CHRMP. Now, coming to topic of the day, I think topic of the day is uh, very interesting. Uh, it is about compensation and benefit and uh, we would be discussing five strategies for effective compensation planning, right? And what should an HR know about this is something that we would be talking about. This is how we have structured this webinar. We would be understanding first, it's important to create an understanding about compensation and benefit in its true sense. And once we have that understanding, we would be talking about various equities. And we would be then talking about compensation planning and the five strategies. And then we would be talking about a bit about CHRMP. And then I would uh, let you ask as many questions to me as possible so that I can help you, I can guide you, and I can increase uh, your understanding of the topic of the day. Now, very, very important for us to understand Understand. Like, no, we have been hearing this for very, very long, isn't it? Uh, uh, there are different ways of uh, projecting it, discussing it. But if you look at, we have compensation, we have benefits, and we uh, some terminologies that also uh, we we use is payroll. All right. Now let's understand that when we talk about payroll, it is about implementation of what has already been planned in compensation and benefits. So payroll is the act of creating of pay slips for employees based on various factors, uh, factors like salaries, factors like the compensation that has been decided, the benefits that we are looking at uh, uh, giving or including, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the leave that employee has taken, all that put together is payroll. So it's the execution part is payroll. When we talk about the planning part, the compensation and benefits. So you have compensation and benefits planning or compensation planning and benefits planning, depending on the nature of business, nature of organization, etc. But it's very, very important for us to have an understanding of what these terminologies mean so that we can plan it better. Right. So compensation is nothing but a systematic approach of providing monetary value to employees in exchange of work being performed. That's very, very important. Let's understand this, right? Uh, that compensation is nothing but monetary value. It is the monetary value. It's the money that is being given. It's the cash that is being given. It is something that be, is being offered in exchange of work that you are performing. And that is what compensation means. Benefit, on the other hand, is the non-monetary value. It is a systematic approach of providing non-monetary value to employees in exchange of work being performed. And it, apart from com uh, compensation, which talks about uh, the money being given, it also assists in motivation, in retention, etc. Right? Is, it, is this clear to everybody that compensation is the monetary value and benefit is the non-monetary value? When we say compensation, we mean money is being given. So for example, if you take up a payroll and there are different components under it wherever money is being given that's a compensation component and wherever cash is not coming in hand you're not receiving it right that is benefits that is the non-monetary value for example when we talk about let's say a payroll you might have a component like basic now basic is a component of compensation Medical insurance, on the other hand, is a component of benefits, right? So uh, organizations which uh, uh, are looking at keeping morale of employees high and they are looking at a very, very hygienic compensation and benefit policy, 
they are aiming at planning compensation and benefits uh, separately. So you can have a compensation strategy or you can have a benefit strategy. When we talk about compensation strategy, you can have a lead strategy, a mid strategy or a lag strategy, right? Uh, mid strategy is sticking to what everyone around is paying. Lag is paying probably less than what the industry is paying. Lead is uh, being aggressive, uh, being uh, follow through in terms of uh, having uh, getting uh, and hiring the most talented people on the ground by offering them better compensation. And similarly, even in benefits, you can have uh, lead lag or mid uh, strategies in terms of hiring, retaining, motivating uh, talent. Yeah. So you have compensation, which is monetary, which is cash uh, driven benefits, which is non monetary and it is not cash uh, driven, but it's benefits driven. It's something, anything which is not, which does not involve money is about benefits. Now with this understanding uh, to be able to plan anything better, right? I think it's important that uh, we understand on what factors does this depend on? Very, very important. This is in fact, anything that we do, um, uh, planning is very important. In fact, when we talk about, let's say a vacation, uh, even then, uh, planning matters a lot, isn't it? What are the factors on which our vacation planning depends? If people can answer quickly, if you are planning a vacation, what do you think are the factors on which the, uh, the vacation planning depends? Right. So you have location, you have budget, you have how you are traveling with whom you are traveling. What are the dates availability in hotels, right? The weather, these are all factors on which vacation planning depends. So to be able to understand compensation planning better or to be able to strategize compensation planning, I think it's important uh, to know the factors on which compensation planning depends. And when we talk about factors, there are different factors that are there. For example, experience, how much experience does a candidate have is a factor which decides on compensation and benefit. The designation that the person has in the organization is uh, uh, a reason for uh, planning of compensation and benefits. The type of work, for example, there can be different type of work. People might be working in day shift. They might be working in night shift. Right. Uh, the work may involve a lot of travel. The work may involve in going to uh, dangerous areas. The work may involve uh, strategic uh, solution thinking kind of role. So technically that also is a reason and a factor on which compensation benefit planning uh, depends. Uh, manpower availability, isn't it? If there is a lot of manpower, similar skilled people, then the cost of hiring or cost of compensation uh, or cost of talent acquisition uh, in terms of salaries, in terms of benefits, in terms of compensation comes down. Uh, so manpower availability is very, very important. Uh, if you have uh, less number of, let's say, software engineers, then uh, companies will go all out in terms of wooing them, paying them more. If they have too many software engineers, the overall salary will come down. Cost of living uh, is very, very important factor in terms of compensation. If you're staying in costly cities, then the compensation component for the same designation may go up compared to uh, a two tier or a three tier city where cost of compensation may go low because the cost of living is less. Uh, competition, uh, uh, what is the market situation? That is very, very important. What is the competition paying? If X company is paying so much, uh, it's competitor Y, what is it paying? What is the Z company paying? What is the A company paying, B company paying? If they're all in the same industry, I think competition plays a very, very important role in terms of determining what you go about paying, right? Uh, another uh, factor which is very important for effective compensation planning is performance of an individual, right? Qualification, what the person has done, studied, uh, all this, uh, whether the person is a chartered accountant, a doctor, uh, um, uh, an MBA, an MBA from a, tier A, tier B, tier C, 
institute, all that matters a lot. Performance of the organization is another component which is very, very important when it comes to deciding on compensation and benefits. How has the overall organization performed? What's the uh, uh, profit after tax? What's the kind of revenues? What is the kind of turnover the organization has uh, gone about seeing is very, very important. Government policies are very important. I think you have to follow law of the land. And if, uh, if, if government is directing something for organizations to follow in terms of compensation and benefit structure, uh, it can be social security of employees, it can be uh, profit sharing with employees. All these are really important. For example, when you say a component like bonus, uh, then it's uh, about profit sharing with employees. When you talk about uh, gratuity, for example, uh, that is there are a number of payrolls across the globe. Uh, the component is being used as loyalty, uh, the number of years that you spend with the company. Uh, so these are all defined by the labor laws and by the policies of the uh, government, which has to be taken into consideration when it comes to compensation benefit planning. I think location also is really, really important. As I said, location can be, if it's a war zone, then uh, the kind of, uh, money that you make would be much higher because there is a risk to your life. Um, apart from that, if it's tier one, tier two, tier three, uh, it gets linked with cost of living. Uh, it also gets linked with other components in terms of uh, the kind of market that is available and what kind of talent you want to hire. So all that uh, uh, is very, very important when it comes to CNB, effective CNB planning. And I think, uh, as we said that, or as we talked about vocation, uh, it's coming very soon. The summer vacation starts in some time in India. But otherwise, uh, if you look at when we talk about vacation and when we talk about all those factors on which vacation planning depends, similarly, any planning depends on factors and compensation planning depends on these factors. Factors like experience, designation, type of work, manpower availability, uh, cost of living, comp competition, performance of individual, qualification, performance of an organization, policies by government, and location, right? There can be more factors as well, but these are some of the key factors on which compensation planning depends. So if, if we look a little in detail uh, on all these factors, we would realize that these factors can be further classified, right? For example, these factors can be classified as internal factors, external factors, and individual factors, right? If we look at what internal factors can be, factors like experience, designation, type of work, qualification, performance of an organization are all internal factors. But when I say fact, internal factors, I mean anything which is in complete control of the organization, right? It can be internal, it's internal to the organization. It's not getting impacted by I mean, I would not say it's not getting impacted by what's happening outside, but the, the complete decision making in terms of uh, uh, how you want to influence it uh, as part of planning is uh, it's internal. How you treat experience is internal. How you name the designation and how you frame the designation and how you want to take a call in terms of uh, what experience gets associated with what designation is completely an in organization's internal decision. The kind of type of work that you go about choosing, the kind of diversification that you want in work, the kind of job enrichment or job enlargement that you're looking at, right? Uh, doing with the organization, uh, do, do, doing with the role or the kind of uh, uh, work, uh, primarily how it shapes up, is completely uh, a call of an organization and it's an internal factor. Similarly, how you treat Qualification is your call. It's the organization's call. And uh, how you define, for example, uh, hiring from uh, different colleges or uh, different certifications, how you qualify and quantify them uh, within the organization for different designations. It's a call that the organization makes. And performance of the organization, end of the day, how the entire organization performance is again, in, it's an internal factor. It's within the organization. It's because of things happening within the organization that uh, the call is made. So all these factors. So out of this broad 
component factors that we talked about i think these five factors primarily and it can be more as well uh, are internal in nature are specific to something that is within the organization right now uh, when we talk about external factor uh, this is when organization doesn't have complete control uh, and it is something that is uh, outside the organization which is influencing the compensation benefit uh, decisions for example what a government decides uh, government decided uh, on, let's say on increasing uh, the maternity uh, be benefit in terms of uh, number of weeks so it's not in an organization's decision tomorrow an organization tomorrow the government decides that any layoff that would happen would not involve let's say x months of pay it would involve uh, x plus 3 months of pay then the organization will have to go about following because this is not in organization's control how a location works uh, how uh, it works across for example when we talk about a city like uh, bangalore let's say about 10 15 20 years back uh, it was this peaceful place where people would want to retire uh, and uh, now if you look at in last 15 20 years the kind of urbanization and industrialization and the kind of uh, i would say it companies itization that has happened uh, is uh, is is something that uh, changes the way uh, location works or cost of living works similarly manpower availability uh, is not in organization's hand and how competition and what other companies pay is not in organization's hand these are all factors which are external to the organization and these comes under external factors and what comes as individual factor is one which is performance of an individual right uh, a very good performance may need some kind of compensation or benefit decision that needs to be made to be able to keep the employee happy to be able to keep the employee motivated to be able to keep the employee contented and that also is a factor which influences compensation and benefit decisions am i clear so far is everybody able to hear me able to follow wonderful so again as we are talking about uh, and and discussing today a quick what of what we have discussed we are talking about compensation and benefit planning and we understood that compensation is monetary value and benefit is non monetary value we understood that for effective planning to happen we should understand the factors on which the planning depends and we listed down all the factors major factors on which compensation benefit planning depends and then we divided them into internal external and individual factor right so basically when we talk about compensation benefit planning i think it's important that the planning involves balancing internal external and individual factors that is something that is very very important however a small correction in here in compensation and benefit we don't call it factors we call it equity right so though it is getting linked as factors however the right term or the right terminology that we use for compensation benefit planning is calling it equity and not factors so basically uh, effective compensation benefit planning is about internal equity external equity and individual equity right it's about balancing good efficient effective compensation and benefit planning is about balancing internal external and individual equity so one very very uh, uh, interesting thing that we would be learning today or we would be aiming at uh, getting an understanding of uh, is how do we achieve this what strategies do we use to achieve internal external and individual equities right now another thing that impacts planning is what are the objectives uh, uh, that compensation planning uh, uh, aims at achieving 
isn't it? That's that's very important. So one of the key factor is achieving internal, external, individual equity. But I think other things also, uh, uh, other objectives also, which effect, effective compensation planning uh, aims at achieving, is to recruit, recruit good talent acquisition, right? And not only to recruit, but also to retain. That is also very important, and that's a very important aspect of effective compensation planning. I think what is also very important is increase and maintain morale. I think motivation levels uh, are high when people are being paid well, right? So it's not only to maintain, it's also to increase the morale, which is very important. It can be used as uh, a tool to reward and encourage peak performance, right? As a tool to reward and encourage peak performance, and as I've already discussed, to achieve internal, external equity and also individual equity. Also, it's about reducing compensation turnover. It's also about reducing compensation turnover. So what do we uh, understand by reducing compensation turnover, which is very, very important because I think other, other, fact, other objectives of planning is very clear to us, isn't it? I think recruitment or talent acquisition is very, very clear to us. Uh, retention is very, very clear to us. Increasing, maintaining morale is clear to us and reward and encourage peak performance is clear to us. Achieving internal external equity is clear to us. However, what does reduction in compensation turnover mean is very, very important for us to understand. Very important for us to understand because uh, uh, when we say compensation turnover, uh, what, what is compensation turnover? Compensation turnover is uh, the entire money that a company pays to its all its employees is compensation turnover, isn't it? Compensation turnover, if you have to define compensation turnover, then what is it? It is all the money that you are paying across levels from entry level to mid management to, uh, to junior management to middle management to senior management to top management everybody who's employed in your company, the net put together the compensation cost is your compensation turnover, right? And uh, one part of effective uh, compensation planning is to reduce that compensation turnover, which means technically reduce the entire money that we are paying as compensation and benefit or as salaries. Right? That is what we are looking at. Right? Do you agree with me? Do you think it's something that organizations would plan in terms of reducing compensation turnover? Yes, to basically reduce salaries. Right? It may be difficult because uh, because uh, if we see year on year, everybody's salaries increase, isn't it? Everybody's salaries increase. So we will look at figuring it out in terms of how compensation planning would aim at reducing compensation turnover, right? Now, one thing that we understand uh, uh, is that organization wants to make profits, right? And how does profit happen? Profit happens when there is increased revenue, right? Uh, also profit happens uh, when there is reduced cost, right? Now, if an organization wants more and more profit, this, to go, th this two things should go in hand, which means revenue should increase and cost should reduce. And one of the most effective way of reducing cost is reducing manpower cost, which is compensation cost. So revenue increase is about have, having better sales target, having covering more locations, selling to more people, reaching out to more audience, X and Y and Z. And reducing uh, compensation cost, uh, I mean, it depends on the industry as well. For example, when you talk about uh, industry like uh, manufacturing, they have a lot of cost. Uh, they have uh, uh, infrastructure cost, they have uh, 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 production cost, they have raw material cost, they have salary or compensation costs, they have 
inventory management cost, they have storage cost, they have transportation cost, all this is there, right? But when we talk about something like, let's say a bank, or when we talk about an industry like IT, uh, you don't have raw material cost, right? You do not have production cost, you do not have, uh, like, I mean, there is a transportation cost, but that, that may not be as high as uh, transporting the material, uh, which has been manufacturing kind of cost. So basically you, remain with two or three broad costs, I mean, infrastructure cost and compensation costs, right? But you're paying salaries to employees and apart from that, the office, the infrastructure that we are talking about, right? So, which, which technically means that if we are aiming at reducing cost, uh, it can only be done in these two segments, right? And even if it's manufacturing, they would look at reducing cost all across so reducing compensation turnover today is a reality and we will aim at understanding how it happens i do understand that it looks a little difficult because uh, from a very very generic perspective if we go about seeing this then salaries are increasing year on year whether it's eight percent ten percent six percent fifteen percent twenty percent whatever it is people are earning more uh, year on year however Mm, uh, uh, from an organization perspective, he's not looking at entirely on one individual's salary. It is looking at aiming at uh, having a strategy that re reduces the overall compensation cost because that's how organization is seeing it. Organization is not seeing how much uh, X person is uh, getting. It's aiming at achieving what we are paying altogether as compensation. And if the percentage increase last year was 12%, we should reduce it to 8%. Or if we paid, let's say $100,000, uh, which is pretty less, but $100,000 as overall compensation cost, uh, why not reduce it to 96 or $98,000, uh, uh, let's say by about 2%. So all effective compensation planning is also about reducing compensation planning. Right. It's very, very important. So it's not only about retaining, rewarding, um, recruiting employees. Uh, it uh, two key components of compensation benefit planning and mainly compensation planning is bring in internal, uh, external and individual equity. And second is to reduce compensation turnover, to reduce compensation turnover it is really, really important. Very, very important, right? Now, uh, how, how do we uh, do that? How, uh, how, do we, uh, uh, how do we plan for this, right? And this is where now strategies will start coming in. We will start learning more and more strategies in terms of how do we go about balancing uh, uh, various things and achieving what compensation planning objective is. So again, before we start with strategies, I think very, very important for us to understand that key component to effective compensation planning uh, is balancing internal equity, external equity and individual equity. And it is also about reducing compensation turnover. And in next uh, half an hour, we would be understanding some uh, strategies, some examples, some uh, 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 something that has been happening in the industry in terms of creating that balance and also in terms of reducing compensation turnover, right? So one of the things that we do in terms of balancing internal equity, right, uh, is creating salary slabs or salary structures, right? Very important for us to understand this again. Internal equity. Now, what were the internal equity factors, right? There were internal equity, isn't it? What were the internal equity factors? It was experience, it was designation, it was type of work, it was qualification, it was performance of an organization. These are all factors on which internal equity uh, depended. And how are we creating that balance? We are creating that balance by creating salary slab or salary structures. Well, let's understand what, what you mean by salary slab and salary structure. Basically, 
there are two types of salary slabs. Uh, type one is salary slab with step increment and uh, uh, type two is salary slab with grade range. And uh, strategy one to bring in uh, internal equity to balance experience, to a balance qualification, to balance type of work, to balance performance of organization, to balance uh, all the internal factors that otherwise exist, education, etc. cetera. Uh, we are using step increment, salary slab with step increment or salary slab with grade range. Now let's understand what salary slab with uh, step increment is. Salary slab with step increment would be something uh, like this, right? It might have, so this is how it would look. It would look something like $12,000 to $15,000 with step increment of $12,750 and $13,500. So basically, if we are talking about, let's say, hiring a chartered accountant or a project lead or a project head, uh, we are talking about uh, him getting uh, monthly salaries between $12,000 to $15,000 with incremental value of $12,750 or $13,500. So normally, even in, in different countries, uh, mostly union positions or government positions have something like this, right? It basically means that an organization to hire somebody uh, can pay either $12,000 or can pay $12,750 or can pay $13,500 or can pay 15,000, right? Uh, however, it cannot pay anything in between. It cannot pay anything in between. So for example, it cannot pay 14,000 or 14,200 or 13,000, it can't pay that. It will only pay either 12. Now, now look at this, how exactly it's balancing uh, um, uh, experience and education. So let's say we are, uh, now, now when we talk about a job description, when you talk about any, any uh, hiring that has been advertised, any uh, designation that has been advertised, you would always see that it would have a, a overall bracket that they would be talking about. They would be talking about two years to five years or two years to six years. So let's say they're saying two years to five years. Now, if you want to map the experience against this, you can say that a five year experience guy would earn 15,000 a four year experience guy would earn 13,500. Uh, a three years experience guy would earn 12,070. And a two years experience guy would earn 12,000. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, hiring from uh, grade A, grade B, grade C, and grade D colleges, then grade A college, it would be 15,000. Grade B college, it would be 13,500. Grade C would be 12,750. And grade D would be $12,000. So basically, if you look at experience, education, etc. Now, uh, if you look at it getting uh, it, it, it uh, uh, the, the type of work, if type of work changes, tomorrow, you can move a person who was earning 12,750 to 13,500. Right. So basically, anything that is internal to the organization, any equity, any factor on which internal equity depends, uh, gets mapped to salary slab with uh, step increment and this has become a very very powerful tool in terms of uh, creating the balance internally right now uh, uh, step increment has one big demerit and i think the, this demerit i just mentioned that you cannot it's not flexible enough you cannot pay let's say 14000 or 14500 or 13000 you have to pay either of these now Tomorrow, in, in a highly competitive environment, let's say you made an offer to somebody for 12,000 and the other company made it, made an offer of 12,200. Now the person is interested in joining where they is getting 12,200. You can only make 12,750. You cannot make 12,500. Or in, in a case where a person has been, is, is being uh, offered uh, 14,000, you can either make 13,500 or you can make 15,000. You cannot make anything in between, which is not flexible enough. I mean, you, uh, it, it should assist in recruitment. It should assist in, ta in talent acquisition. And this is only possible if this is flexible enough, right? Uh, so to get that flexibility, I think uh, the type two 
of salary slab, which is with step increment works wonders, right? It works uh, wonders. So if we are talking about, let's say yearly salaries of uh, uh, four lakh to six lakh dollars, we have a range. Now, when you say a range, you're not talking about step increment. You're not talking about 12,000 to 12,750 to 13,500 to 15,000. You are saying four to six lakhs. Now, anything between four to six lakhs would do. So basically, if we offer four lakhs and uh, the competition offers four lakh twenty, you can match four lakh twenty, or you can offer four lakh twenty five or four lakh thirty. Uh, if the competition goes about put, putting it four lakh fifty, you can go about making it four lakh fifty five, right? So basically, uh, uh, you you don't get stuck at this incremental uh, hierarchical structure. Uh, it is very, very open structure where you can go about offering any salary between that grade range that you want. So 4 lakh is the lower part of the grade range. 6 lakh is the higher part of the grade range. And uh, depending on the business situation, depending on the hiring need, depending on the talent acquisition need, depending on uh, promotion needs depend, uh, or appraisal needs, you can take a call in terms of how you want to uh, uh, use it, but in terms of how experience gets mapped, how qualification gets mapped, how type of work gets mapped, how performance of all that can be mapped against the grade range as well in a very, very flexible way, in a very, very flexible way. And this certainly, certainly solves one big problem for recruiters as it aids in negotiation. Is it clear? Right. So strategy one that we have, we have tried and strategy one is not over yet, but just to have a quick overview of uh, what strategy one looks like is that strategy one is aiming at uh, uh, creating uh, uh, a balance and to achieve the first balance, uh, it is important to maintain internal equity uh, within the organization. And this is being achieved through creating salary slabs and salary slabs are either in uh, terms of step increment or uh, in, in terms of grade range. And uh, I think, um, uh, I think uh, I have written step increment, basically it's called grade range. It is nothing but grade range. If you look at the previous slide, it was step increment and this one is grade range, it's called Grade range. However, one of the key component in terms of whether we are talking about uh, uh, step increment or grade range is maintaining the median. It's really important. So I think the strategy one would not be complete if we don't talk about maintaining the median, which is very, very, very important. Now, why is it important? It's important because uh, salary is not only the component which is driving how much I earn, uh, humans have a tendency to compare. So let's say I was offered a role uh, for four lakh dollars and I was really happy and I joined the company and tomorrow I find somebody sitting next to me asking me doubts earning five lakhs, right? I would be like, what is this, right? I should earn that money and I would then immediately be demotivated or I would immediately be looking for opportunities uh, apart from that company because I know what I'm worth now, right? And what companies are paying. So we are constantly, it's very, very, it's an emotional thing, right? And a salary is an open secret. Now it's an open secret because most of the people do at some point of time go about discussing how much money they make, right? Uh, but then they cannot really go back to management and say that you have paid him more so you pay me more also right so it's open but it has to be a secret it's an open secret now in that ambience in in that how do we not only recruit but also retain people so uh, to retain people i think one of the key components that helps is maintaining a median now what is a median median is the midpoint of the salary slab and when we are hiring for a particular designation or a particular team we have to ensure that the average salary for the team or for the designation or for that level 
within the organization meets the median meets the median so for example if we are talking about 4 lakhs to 6 lakhs the midpoint or the median is 5 lakhs and when we are let's say having 10 people in a team who are working at the same designation it's important that their average salary is around 5 lakhs right so uh, so 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 that would take care of uh, associated with alone it's very how much i earn but what's also important is how much my colleagues are uh, uh, earning how much uh, they are making right so it's really important that i'll just quickly repeat once i think it's very important that uh, we understand the importance of median because what uh, Am I audible to everybody? Okay, great. So uh, when we talk about maintaining a median, I think it's really important that median is maintained because it's not only important how much I earn, it's also important how much the colleagues around me are earning right so as part of compensation benefit planning just creating a pay slab map to a job role or a designation is not enough what is important is that you create a median and you suggest this to the recruiters to guide so when you're releasing budgets for recruitment let's say when when a budget gets released for recruitment it's important that the median is kept into mind and it's released, right? So though it, if it, it can be four to uh, six lakhs, but you may not release the entire four to six lakhs. It, uh, you will release, let's say four to 5.5 or four to uh, 5.2 because you want hiring to end with the maximum salary that is being paid at 5.2 uh, because uh, uh, you want men, median to be maintained. Just a simple example, if somebody is uh, if, if the gap is too much if the gap is one lakh two lakh then it's definitely demotivating but the gap is less so let's say we are again talking about four lakhs to six lakhs and five lakh being median and let's say a set uh, one individual is earning 4.8 and another individual is earning 5.2 the average if you see is five right and if a 4.8 guy even gets to know somebody's earning 5.2 he would not think that it's not achievable you would think that it's hardly a difference and let me work hard. Let me get better rankings. Let me get better appraisals and let me match that. Right. But if the gap is more, it becomes demotivating because then you know that you cannot cover that gap no matter how hard you work. Right. So maintaining the median is key to implementation of strategy one, which is maintaining, uh, uh, creating a salary structure or salary slab whether it's the step increment way or whether it's the uh, uh, grade range way. Either way, I think maintaining the median becomes very important. And also note that uh, when, uh, though this looks like what we are discussing is very specific to internal equity, but it's, we have to understand that uh, these are all interlinked, right? So internal and external equity are also interlinked, individual equity and external individual equity is also interlinked if tomorrow somebody is performing really well you know what external entities can pay and you know what your internal standards are so you would look at mapping that across so basically it's important that uh, uh, i mean salary slab is not only an internal balancing internal equity tool actually it's also doing more in terms of uh, other two equities being balanced but yeah mainly mainly it's taking care of uh, largely it's taking care of the internal equity right okay now uh, strategy two that we need to understand uh, uh, as part of what we teach in uh, chrmp certified human resource management professional is uh, also external equity isn't it i think it's important that we uh, balance external equity now what is external equity again external equity is what's not in organization's control. So location, cost of living, 
availability of manpower, what the competition is paying, government policies, etc. I think these are all that is happening outside the organization and that information is really important for us to be able to plan effectively. Uh, we should be able to plan our compensation and benefit well and for that this information is important. So I think uh, one key criteria in this uh, as part of strategy is uh, gathering information and studying information and getting uh, 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 definite measurable uh, uh, outcomes through that, right? We cannot make a, a, a very generic decision or a feeling based or gut based decision that oh, X company would be paying so much, no, uh, Y company would be saying so much, or oh, let's go to uh, X state or X country and we can hire because there are so many engineering colleges or manufacturing companies, etc. It would be easy. No, you should not go about making these generalizations. I think it's important that we make database decisions and database based decisions comes through uh, 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 studying what's happening in the market on all these parameters, uh, parameters of location, parameters of cost of living or inflation, the parameter of uh, 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 availability of manpower, the competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's really important that we are able to make a more analytical or data-based uh, decision and uh, this can be done by studying salary surveys. I think that's really important. It can be done by studying salary surveys. A lot of salary surveys are available in the market. There are some top-notch organizations who go about doing this. There are a lot of smaller setups which are go who go about doing it. Some companies which come up with salary surveys for respective countries or regions are William Mercer, McKinsey, Hewitt Associates, KPMG, etc. But apart from that, I think every government in every country goes about coming up with what you call is salary reports or pay commission reports, uh, which you can go about accessing or buying. And then uh, that gives you uh, various indicators. They give you indicators of average salary, about inflation, about uh, cost of living, about uh, how salary budgets are being managed, about the kind of hikes and appraisals that are being done, uh, about industry-wise uh, salary, uh, industry and level-wise. So it can be, let's say, manufacturing industry, entry level is giving 8% hike. Uh, however, banking at junior management uh, is uh, giving 0% hike and uh, let's say, uh, pharma in uh, uh, mid management is giving giving neg negative hikes or at entry level is giving negative hikes all this is possible and even negative hi uh, uh, hikes are also possible for example uh, let's say last year there were 30 uh, mba and engineering colleges where you were hiring but now you have increased that base to 50 or 60 now the moment you have increased that base to 50 and 60 and let's say the net number of people you want to hire remains the same. Uh, you can go about negotiating better salaries at entry level, which means let's say instead of paying $10,000 per person, you might now be paying $6,000 or $7,000 per, 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 per employee. And you may get the same set of uh, uh, crowd or uh, um, prospective employees with similar skills, uh, though you are saving cost. Right. So all these are possibilities, right? All these are possibilities, but to be able to do it better, I think it's important that you have to study. And this is very, very region specific, state specific, country specific um, uh, and, and industry specific. So this uh, effective external equity planning can happen as part of our strategy is by studying this, is by studying this. And as I said that uh, once you have these inputs, you can relate it to your current structure. You can relate it to your current structure and uh, 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 the current salary slabs that you have and accordingly take a call in terms of what your standing uh, in the industry is, right? 
uh, balancing internal equity uh, and uh, also internal equity actually for example also depends on how you create that slab so one one thing that probably uh, also comes into picture is the skill or the competency needed to do the job and how it gets mapped to creation of the salary slab so when you write down about the skills and competency and you create levels across it uh, you use tools like point plan or hey plan or anything else in terms of mapping it across i think that's when you understand that at what level of skilled people what uh, the are the competencies that people have and what they are getting paid up across and how much you should pay them this is very very important so basically i i mean because it's a webinar i cannot discuss this but otherwise uh, it, point plan is a very strong method which helps you balance both internal and external equity but to have a very generic understanding of what strategy we need to evolve to balance external equity i think the strategy that we need to have is to industry wise uh, state wise nation wise or region wise uh, procure or get or buy uh, a salary survey and study it to be able to understand what is happening across and then decide whether you want to go take the lead way the mid way or the lag way Right. that is something that can be done now coming to strategy 3 i think it is about uh, 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 balancing uh, individual equity uh, that's very very important now let me give you an example uh, right now let's say there is a sales person and the sales person's uh, salary is uh, Ten thousand dollars based on hundred percent achievement of uh, results or target, right? So his fixed component is six thousand, and the variable component is four thousand. Now what you have done is that you have gone about giving him a target. Let's say you've given him a target of uh, one million, and based on that one million, the person can earn up to ten thousand rupees, but you're stopping it. there right so 6000 is what you are paying him as part of fixed component and based on achievement of target he can make only another 4000 dollars now uh, this seems good because if the person is performing he is taking good but let's say there has been an exceptional performance right the person has gone about not selling for 1 million the person has gone about selling for let's say 10 million or 15 million possible right now a good compensation planner uh, would have had a strategy for this because now you can think of 1 million you can think of 1.5 you can also think of 2 million but what about if the achievement is 5 times 10 times 20 times then how do you go about uh, uh balancing the this great performance and how do you create the balance for individual equity very very important so that basically happens by coming up with what we call is the open ended pay structure the open ended pay structure right so let's say for up to 100% of target achievement he earns 10000 uh, dollars but then you create a slab and then not only slab you leave the slab open ended as well for example if you look here 100 to 200 percent of target achievement, the person makes additional 2 percent of total revenues. 200 to 5 percent, the person makes 3 percent of additional revenues. 500 and above, the person makes 5 percent of total revenues. I mean, these are all subjective. This is just an example, uh, right? Uh, I mean, some is, at some places, what I have seen is 100 to 200, 5 percent, 200 to 500, 3 percent, 500 and more. as 2% as well it totally depends on the organization totally depend on the nature of business the margins etc what you are selling what you are uh, doing that but mainly see, seen in sales position sometimes also seen in uh, customer service or uh, operations uh, positions uh, rarely seen 
in support positions like accounts, finance, HR, etc. Uh, however, uh, uh, it's important that you have a structure like this. Otherwise, if you are a big organization and somebody does this performance, you don't know how to go about accommodating that, right? You don't know how do we go about paying him. Now, if you don't pay him, he knows his worth. He will quit and go. You will lose a high performing employee, which would be not so conducive for an organization. And at all costs, the person should not only be retained, he should be rewarded. Uh, and uh, that can be done by creating what we call this open ended pay structure, open ended pay structure. So basically, though the, there is a slab which is there, however, that slab, the upper limit of that slab is, uh, uh, is, is can, can be variable, right? It can go up to any amount based on the kind of performance the individual does. And that helps us balance individual equity right now strategy four uh, that we are talking about is about reducing compensation turnover so how do you reduce compensation turnover so i think the age old method that organizations have used by so basically uh, first three strategies that we have learned uh, the first being about internal equity the second being about external equity the third being about individual equity the fourth strategy uh, and the fifth strategy is about reducing compensation turnover so i think uh, fourth strategy is a very easy very simple uh, very sweet strategy i think organizations have been doing it for ages uh, they have gone about hiring interns or commission based uh, agents uh, in a lot of places uh, in terms of uh, full time employees and uh, they uh, they have to only pay when uh, there is a performance or they have to pay less right so i think one and i have started with this strategy because it's such a simple strategy isn't it and just to be aware of that it is nothing but a re reducing of compensation turnover strategy uh, hiring interns or hiring commission based agents uh, for various roles is something that is a uh, reducing compensation turnover strategy right now uh, coming to uh, the fifth strategy i think again reducing compensation i think one of very interesting strategy is esop right giving esop which is employee stock options employee stock options so you would have heard of this that a lot of companies go about uh, a lot of companies go about uh, offering uh, shares to their employees now how does it work now initially it was about ownership it was about employee engagement it was about making employees uh, having a feel of uh, giving them ownership involving them to the larger mission and vision of the organization it was about job satisfaction it was about employee happiness however lately esop has also turned out to be a compensation turnover strategy reducing compensation turnover strategy. Now, how, how does this work? So let's understand what is an ESOP. ESOP is uh, a share value of the company uh, based on a projection that is being made in terms of what is the proved valuation of the company, right? Now, this is not necessarily uh, the real revenue turnover. This is not really the uh, real uh, revenue, but this is uh, 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 valuation of the company on paper. Uh, the actual may differ, right? The whole idea of investments in companies uh, that startups uh, go about taking is based on that. They are creating a valuation based on which they are saying that uh, if we achieve our potential, we would be a $10 billion company. And if you want, uh, 10% of it, you have to invest 1 billion, right? So that, that is how, but, but actually maybe the revenue is only, let's say $500 million. That's a possibility, right? So when we talk about ESOP, ESOP is based on the larger projection, the ma larger market capitalization that we are talking about. So first of all, it's not the real actual on ground value. And now that it is being offered to an employee as part of the package. So you are reducing somewhere the real compensation 
and then you are adjusting that compensation uh, or you are showing it inflated by adding a component of ESOP, which is employee stock options. And then you have a lock in period for that ESOP, which technically means that by joining the company and getting the share, the person cannot sell it off, right? He can sell it off only after uh, either in packets or only after finishing a particular tenure. For example, let's say the tenure is three years. So only after finishing three years, you can go about selling this across. Now, if you don't fi finish three years, uh, then this you resign and you go and you're not able to benefit out of that ESOP. Right. And now this ESOP moves to another person who joins in place of you and he gets that ESOP. And if he also doesn't finish three years, he again does not benefit out of that. So basically there is paper exchange. Paper is moving from one desk to another desk to another desk to another desk but you are not able to really, really benefit. I would not say you, but I would say that an employee is not able to uh, really benefit out, uh, uh, out of it. So one is this long tenure lock in, let's say only after three years. The second is, let's say 100 shares are given and uh, every year you can uh, uh, go about selling 20%. So 20 into five is 100, right? So it's, let's say five year tenure. So after finishing one year, 20%, uh, you can go about selling finishing second year another 20 percent you can sell finishing third year but technically it's still in compensation part you have been given 100 shares and that you uh, uh, you, you have what you would have actually paid you have gone about paying little less and then you have this whole lock-in that's coming across and the whole idea of share is based on market capitalization and not not real value and if in case you're leaving early which is mostly the case and that's how strategies are made uh, that not everybody finishes that tenure. They talk about, they look at data analytic, analytics before and see that X percentage stay back, Y percentages don't. And uh, that would overall help us reduce the cost by let's say 2% or 1% or 5%. You go about deciding your employee stock options, uh, which is very interesting, isn't it? It is really, really interesting when we talk about employee stock options. Isn't it right? So when we talk about compensation strategies, uh, strategy one is salary slabs. Strategy two is uh, salary surveys and studying that across. Salary three is having having open-ended pay structures. Strategy four was a simple strategy, not so. Uh, I mean, just to introduce you to the idea of redu reducing compensation turnover, it was uh, it was. Uh, uh, interns and commission based agents that you hire instead of full time employees and strategy five is employee stock options introducing them and ensuring that people uh, ensuring that organization is able to save cost. Now these are five strategies, but just because you have come to this webinar and this is CHRMP, I would give you one more strategy for free and that is strategy number six. So this six strategy comes your way which is again a reduction compensation turnover strategy and that is increasing the probation period, right? So across the globe, there is probation period and there is a limit to that probation period. For example, uh, in some countries, it is three months and you can extend it by another three months, which means the maximum probation period that you can have is about six months, right? Uh, in some countries, it is six months, uh, extendable by another six months, which technically means the maximum probation period that you can have is about one year. Also, in a lot of countries during the probation period, uh, certain policies uh, do not apply. For example, um, paid leaves do not apply. Privileged leaves do not apply. Uh, if you take any leave other than, let's say, optional or regional or national holidays or sick leaves, or maybe even sick leaves do not apply or casual leaves do not apply. Now, if your tenure was three months during those three months, let's say a company has about 36 leaves in, in 12 months, the company has about 36 leaves. We are talking about three leaves per uh, month in three months uh, of probation. You get to see, save, uh, save about nine leaves, but in a six month probation, you get to save about 18 leaves, right? Uh, in nine months probation, you get to save about 27, 
and again you get to save about 36 leaves and even if you remove the regional and the national holidays which would be about let's say 8 to 10 still you get to save those leaves right and if a person goes about taking a leave there is loss of pay or even if you give all the leaves still the person is not entitled for privileged leave for example privileged leave or paid leave is something when if you don't take that leave you get uh, 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 money right you still get to just by having this policy that there would be no paid or privileged leave applied during probation period let's say for uh, some companies have laws like every 20 working day one paid leave will be given or one privileged leave will be given uh, now uh, a person works for six months or one year you are able to save uh, one into number of i mean about 10 to 12 privileged leaves and that entire saving is being done and it's reflecting on your reducing compensation turnover and how are you doing it you're doing it by increasing the probation period you're doing it by increasing the probation period which again becomes very very interesting uh, strategy number six so six strategy is absolutely absolutely on the house and so is strategy number seven seven is my lucky number so i just thought i'll go about uh, giving you two strategies more or less for reducing uh, for for compensation planning uh, as additional uh, uh, as you have taken time and as again as i said this is chrmp right now again when we talk about reducing compensation turnover i think one very interesting strategy is the idea of performance pay right i want everybody to uh, listen to this really well because i think it is one of the most efficient and effective strategy when it comes to reducing compensation turnover now uh, let me explain by first talking about every every salary component across uh, the globe almost in all countries have a component of fixed and have a component of variable fixed component mainly is driven by government policies of law of land right or the labor laws right variable component on the other hand depends statutory and non-statutory so the fixed component is statutory and the variable component is non-statutory right now uh, when we talk about the non-statutory component uh, organization can go about playing around to a certain extent to uh, aim at and aim at achieving objective of compensation planning which is reducing compensation turnover and one of the very effective ways is performance pay now let me give you an example uh, let's say four to six lakh um, let's say six lakh is somebody's ctc right the ctc the cost of company is six lakhs now uh, four lakh is fixed and two lakh is variable now you decide that out of the six lakh uh, and out of this two lakh variable one lakh would be performance pay, right so there is six lakhs in this one lakh is performance pay right now what would performance pay depend on performance pay would depend on the performance of an individual how is performance of an individual being rated mostly it is being rated in a scale of one to five right so when you say that one lakh is based on performance when would a person get that one lakh the person will get that one lakh only when his performance or her performance is five out of five if the performance is four out of five he or she will not get one lakh he or she will get eighty thousand if the performance is three out of five then he or she will get sixty thousand not one lakh and performance two out of five will get forty thousand and performance one out of five will get 20,000. So your the next CTC on paper, on offer letter, on appointment letter, etc., is 6 lakhs. 1 lakh component becomes part of performance pay. If a person gets uh, 5 out of 5, only then the person is making 6 lakhs. How many people do get 5 out of 5? Very few, right? 5 to 10 percent in an organization, which technically means 90 percent people in your organization get to take home less than what has been committed through an offer letter or an appointment letter 
right? Uh, when, a, when, when a performance appraisal happens, then uh, let's say an average rating might be 3.5 out of 5. 3.5 out of 5 uh, would be about 70,000, right? Which technically means that the net salary that you're paying is not 6 lakhs, it is 5.7 lakhs. It is 5.7 lakhs. You are clearly saving, you are clearly saving component of uh, uh, of cost that helps you reduce the compensation turnover. Is it clear? Everybody able to hear me? Everybody able to see me? Everybody able to see the screen? Right? Performance pay. Now some organizations go uh, uh, a step further. They say performance pay part two. What is performance pay part two? Like like Jaws one, Jaws two, like uh, Jurassic Park one, Jurassic Park two. Part two is always little more lethal than part one. Uh, part two says that we'll have something like a performance point, right? Anybody who reaches that performance point gets hundred percent of performance pay. So let's say four out of five is the performance point. Anybody who reaches four out of five gets the entire performance pay. So earlier in performance pay part one, if you were doing four out of five, you were making 80,000 not 1 lakh. However, in this new case, if you reach 4 out of 5, you make 1 lakh and not uh, 80,000, which is good. You are earning more, isn't it? Then how is it reducing compensation? Uh, but what about people who don't reach that uh, performance point? People who don't reach that performance point gets paid 50% less or 60% less than what they were already getting. So if somebody gets 3, uh, actually, he will only get 20,000, uh, not 60,000. So you, uh, because you have kept that performance point as a bait where anybody who touched that performance point gets rewarded, but anybody who doesn't touch that performance point actually gets punished. So it's not a simple scale. 3.5 out of 5 is uh, 70,000. Uh, no, uh, 3 out of 3.5 out of 5 is now being paid as maybe 2 out of 5. Right? Only because you have not touched or so you can play around with performance pay and you can look at reducing the compensation turnover. Is it clear everybody? Right? Strategy one, strategy two, strategy three, strategy four, strategy five and two on the house strategy, strategy six and strategy seven, strategy six and strategy seven. Right? Yeah. Now, remember that give me a second, right? Now, now remember what we are discussing today is nothing but compensation benefit planning and strategies associated with compensation benefit planning. I think the whole world, domain of human resource is really interesting. I think uh, 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 one of the most diverse domains is human resource management. If you talk about the whole idea of talent acquisition, the whole idea of talent management, talent development, compensation benefit, payroll, employee engagement, HR operations, all that, that put HR shared services, all that when it comes together, uh, it creates the whole vertical of human resource. Everything has link with each other. For example, uh, compensation has uh, is linked with performance, as I just spoke to you about. Uh, performance sometimes is linked with training because if there is if the, there is a difference between desired and done performance, you go about uh, you go about uh, taking a call whether to train or to fire. But there there is a linkage that that comes across. Uh, so, so basically, uh, uh, in CHRMP, in Certified Human Resource Management Professional, uh, we bring the best practices that are there in the world today and bring it to your own table and we bring it in form of a certification. This certification can be taken in classroom in various cities, cities like Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Delhi, Dhaka, Malaysia, Singapore, Dubai, uh, etc. Uh, uh, however, this can also be done at your own pace, at your house, at wherever you are in form of self-paced learning. And I think I'll just take three minutes to briefly talk about 
this certification. I think CHRMP advanced certification is something that I would propose to you. If you're a fresher, you can do a foundation certification, but if you're experienced uh, in HR or otherwise, you can go about taking up the advanced certification and it would have different criteria uh, in self-paced program. Everybody gets a username, password and login and it goes about watching episodes and links and giving quizzes and seeing the presentations and uh, uh, learning all these components. They can attend doubt clearing sessions that happen from time to time to ask the doubts that they have and what gets uh, uh, covered uh, is all these components like understanding business savviness, uh, understanding the in, uh, uh, demand business partner, employee relation, employee engagement, employee branding, HR policies, learning and development, competency mapping, uh, uh, all this so compensation benefit payroll, talent acquisition, all these different components you go about learning. And when it comes to its validation, I think uh, CHRMP is one of the few globally valid certifications in the world today. Uh, you write a multiple choice questions uh, that, 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 that are there and the certification partner being Pearson View. Pearson View is the same certification partner for likes of Cisco, for uh, Microsoft, for uh, Six Sigma, for project management, etc. The top notch uh, certifications in the world, CHRMP has the same certification and anybody who aims at becoming CHRMP certified is aiming at getting the best knowledge that can push the career forward, right? All this that I'm discussing today, these are the best of what is happening in the globe today. And I think if anybody who's serious about uh, taking a career forward should invest in the most important thing, uh, and that is uh, themselves, right? And through knowledge creation and not only knowledge creation through learning and validation, which means you get to learn the best uh, of what's happening. And you also get validated with something which is really special and which brings more credential to your profile. Uh, you are able to uh, move to the next ladder faster, right? And that is what CHRMP certification is all about. Uh, before I leave uh, questions open to uh, every uh, uh, buddy, I would uh, just quickly ask, I'll probably, uh, sorry, I'll, uh, probably share this across. This is, uh, this is the CHRP Academy that I'm talking about. Uh, you log in into the CHRMP Academy and once you log in into the CHRMP, this is your homepage, you go to your dashboard and you then go about seeing different programs. For example, CHRMP Advanced has compensation planning, competency mapping, job analysis, performance management, behavior when interviewing, employee engagement, uh, also topics like talent acquisition, learning and development, HR policies, etc. Once you click on learning and development, you see all the modules which are there within learning and development. So there would be a series of videos, 10, 12, 15, 18 videos talking about uh, uh, the cutting edge concepts that exist in, in uh, let's say l and and similarly in each, each topic. You start the program and once you start the program, you get to so it's taking a bit longer because probably I am on on everything that is possible. I'm on Facebook Live. I'm <laughs> in conversation with you here. So playing a video is taking time, but it's a 4K digital video with a lot of clarity, uh, very good sound effect, a lot of material to read, uh, presentations to go by. And after every module, there is a quiz that tests your understanding of, 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 of the topic. Uh, 
just to give you an idea of what it may look like. If you're able to see this, I'm not sure, but I'll probably stop in a minute. Think about the training programs you have attended in your life. Could be in your organization or even outside. All training programs have something in common. They are all trying to do one of these three things. They are either trying to enhance your knowledge or they are trying to help you develop skills or they are trying to change or influence your attitude. Right. So, and then probably you can go about uh, writing quizzes and all that, all this is something that you can do. You can also visit www.chrmp.com to go and register for a free preview for one of the courses and then probably take a call in terms of taking up the certification. The certification is available on www.chrmp.com. Uh, you should, as I said, invest in uh, knowledge building and you should invest in a certification like CHRMP. All, all the people at CHRMP has put in a lot of effort in terms of uh, doing this, uh, bringing this across to you. I'll just do a quick recap of, of what we have uh, gone about uh, learning, right? We, we started the program with with talking about compensation and benefit and five strategies of compensation benefit planning. Kindly note, please have your doubts ready because after this, I would be attending to all your doubts that you have. We discussed uh, what is compensation and what, what is benefit. We understood compensation is monetary value that we provide and benefit is the non-monetary value that we uh, provide. Uh, we understood uh, that uh, there are factors on which compensation benefit depend. And if you understand this factor, you would understand the planning better. We understood that there are internal, external and individual factors, which uh, are basically experience, designation, type of work, qualification, performance of individual, external factors like government policies, location, manpower ability, cost of living, competition, market standard, etc., and also individual factors like performance of an individual. However, they are not called factors, they are called equity. So it's called internal equity, external equity and individual equity. We understood that compensation benefit planning is about balancing internal and external equity and also to meet objectives of compensation, uh, which one of the key objective is reducing compensation turnover, right? We also understood uh, that uh, there are different strategies that can be applied to uh, achieve this objective of uh, in balancing internal, external, individual equity, and also reducing compensation turnover. Strategy one was having a salary slab, either with step increment or with grade range. We understood uh, both step increment and its limitation and grade range, uh, which does not have that limitation and which brings the flexibility. However, what is very, very important is to maintain a median, is to maintain a median. Median is the midpoint and average salaries to set up people working in the same designation or team should match that median. Strategy two, we understood to balance external equity, we should study salary surveys and we should understand key indicators like inflation, average salary, cost of living, um, uh, the budget, uh, the uh, location, the government policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we should uh, look at local reports or reports by uh, international journals. Uh, which uh, classify this across to us in a very, very structured format based on the state, city, region, uh, nation, uh, or the country, right? Uh, the third strategy that we understood was about managing, uh, balancing uh, individual equity, where we talked about uh, ha having open-ended pay structure, where apart from uh, the salary slab that you have created, the upper limit of the slab is open to getting more by an individual based on his or her performance. Strategy four, we understood uh, the idea of reduction of compensation turnover. In fact, four to seven was all about reduction of compensation turnover with likes of uh, interns and commission-based pay rather than full-time employees, uh, use of ESOPs, which is employee stock options, 
to be able to reduce the compensation turnover, uh, increasing the probation period. And one of the very, very key strategy was using the tool called performance pay. This is what we have discussed today in strategies of effective compensation planning. And now I would like you to ask whatever questions you uh, have. You can probably type it in the chat window and that would give me an idea of what doubts you have. I would be happy to help.